Good afternoon, everyone. Bienvenue à cet uh, événement de l'Institut de recherche sur la science, la société et la politique publique. This is our first Food for Thought session of 2024, and it is actually the third in a series of panels that are focused on the Institute's open access volume, democratizing risk governance, bridging science, expertise, deliberation, and public values. Uh, this is the fruit of a multi-year research project spearheaded by the ISSP with multiple collaborators, both in Canada and uh, the United States. Cet événement va avoir lieu en anglais, mais si jamais vous avez des questions, veuillez uh, les poser en français, donc dans la langue de votre choix, lors de la période de questions. We'll begin with an Indigenous affirmation. Uh, it's the affirmation at the University uh, of Ottawa. We pay respect to the Algonquin people, who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region, from all nations across Canada, who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honour their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. So I'd encourage all of you to acknowledge the uh, territory from which you're joining us uh, today. Uh, before getting into the event uh, for today or with our speakers, I'd like to introduce you to the Institute for Science, Society and Policy, if you're not familiar with, uh, with us. We're a cross-faculty institute at the University of Ottawa, exploring the links among science, society and policy. Our five-year strategic vision is to help Canada transform decision-making to meet the grand challenges of our time. At the Institute, we pursue this strategic vision by strengthening relationships among academia, business, government, Indigenous organizations, and civil society. The book we'll be discussing today is a nice illustration of that in action. We've got three key focus areas in our strategic plan at the Institute, fostering public trust and expertise and expert-based decision-making, supporting co-production of government policies by government business, Indigenous, academic, and civil society leaders, and weaving together technological and social innovation. Again, you'll see those focus areas shine through uh, in the session today. So I'll introduce our event uh, for today, and we'll get uh, jump right into our presentations. This is a third uh, event, as I mentioned, in a series of book promotion panels for our new open access book, Democratizing Risk Governance, Bridging Science, Expertise, Deliberation, and Public Values. Uh, available online open access with uh, Palgrave. Uh, it's the fruits of a multi-year research study. I'm going to describe the study and then we'll hear from a number of our research team members joining us here today. So as, as many of you know, uh, I see from looking at uh, those who are with us today, many of you who are risk uh, governance practitioners and scholars, uh, risk scholars and practitioners are grappling with how best to govern risk in the face of growing calls and rationales for democratization of risk decision-making. The centrality of public trust to effective risk governance, the fragmentation of perceptions of risk in society, and growing expectations for public involvement in risk decision-making all characterize risk governance in the 21st century. The COVID-19 global health pandemic is a vivid, example that underscores the critical importance of public trust in risk decision-making. Whether trust in the safety of vac vaccines, trust in the necessity of lockdown measures, or trust in the very existence of the pandemic itself, successfully addressing the pandemic over time has hinged on public confidence in government decisions. The pandemic also made visible how perceptions and risks of risk can differ among and between experts and the public. It made visible how public perceptions of risk are forever vulnerable to misinformation and disinformation, and also made visible the importance of government for governments of incorporating the views of citizens, communities, and stakeholders into their decision-making. So against this backdrop, the ISSP created the project At Risk, How to Strengthen Risk Governance in Canada. The project aimed to advance scholarly and empirical understandings of public participation in risk decision-making of ways to conceptualize and address differences in public and expert perceptions of risk and means to foster public trust in risk governance. The project comprised a multidisciplinary research team of more than two dozen scholars and graduate students from almost a dozen Canadian and US universities, as well as about six senior practitioners from five partner organizations, the ISSP, 
the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, the Canadian Public Health Association, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, and the Genetic Engineering and Society Center at North Carolina State University. The project received funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and Genome Canada through the Partnership Development Grant Program and the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Social Sciences also contribute. We're very grateful for that support. It would not have been possible to undertake this study without it. Central to the project were practitioner members of the research team who gave generously of their time, experience and insights throughout the study to ensure the research was grounded in and informed by the real worlds of risk governance. The project focused on 10 case studies in three policy areas, energy, public health, and genomics. Our session today features two academic members of the team who focused on the public health uh, area of, uh, of our inquiries, Dr. Michelle Dreger, Professor and Department Head of the Max Rady College of Medicine, Community Health Sciences, University of Manitoba, and Dr. Stuart Nichols, the, uh, who comes to us from the Ottawa Methods Center at the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research Program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. That is a mouthful, uh, Stuart. So I understand now why it's turned into an acro an acronym, OMC SPORE. Uh, we'll look forward to, to hearing more from you. Uh, so both Michelle and Stuart will share their analyses and reflections on the strengths and limitations of public involvement in public health decision making, drawing on detailed case studies in three areas, screening for breast cancer and prostate cancer, screening for, uh, sorry, newborn blood spot screening, and decision making for COVID vaccine priority groups. Uh, we'll begin with some opening remarks from both researchers and then move to a Q&A and a moderated uh, discussion. So I encourage you, uh, who, those of you who are joining us today, if you've got a question, please uh, type it into the Q&A uh, section of, of Zoom. Uh, don't hesitate to, to put it in immediately as you think about it, uh, soit en anglais, soit en français. Donc, without further ado, we will uh, start with by hearing from our researchers today. And we'll begin with Dr. Stuart Nichols. Stuart, over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I just do have a couple of slides to sort of go with this as the traditional academic approach. Um, so yes, um, thank you for the opportunity to join the panel today. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some work around decision-making at the program level for newborn blood spot screening, but I'm here as a representative of a, of a larger team. And I, I particularly want to sort of highlight uh, and thank Marissa and Sarah who did a lot of the empirical work and and sort of day-to-day -day management of this project. So, you know, we couldn't do this without uh, that sort of team. Um, newborn blood spot screening is a program of screening, one of many that occur in the newborn or infant period. Others examples are, are sort of newborn hearing screening, um, but we're gonna focus here on the blood spot screening. And it's, it's a program that's been around since the 1960s. And, as you can see on the, the image on the right, it, it's based on a very small amount of blood being taken, usually 24 to 72 hours after birth, uh, usually through a heel prick or a heel lance. And then that blood's taken and stored onto to cards like the one you see in the, the image, and that's sent away for analysis to see whether there uh, is a risk of one of a number of different conditions that would have lifelong implications. So that, that initial uh, result is then followed up with confirmatory testing uh, and, and treatment by uh, healthcare professionals. So that's the that's the sort of context, that's the program. I don't have time to go into a lot of details, but I will say that it's not mandatory, but it is considered standard of care across Canada. Uh, and the reality is that almost all babies actually go through newborn screening. Next slide, please. So these are uh, established principles for the implementation or adoption of a screening program. They're not specific to newborn blood spot screening. Uh, and these were developed in the late 1960s by the WHO. And you can see that uh, there are a number of different principles. Now they're often referred to criteria, but the original inception was as principles. And as you can see, those principles reflect some quite subjective uh, assessments. So for example, if we think of it, the first principle, the condition should be an important health problem. What do we mean by important? Uh, accepted treatment or a suitable test. What do those terms mean? If the test is to be acceptable to the population, what does that actually mean? And what populations are we talking about? So even though there are these 
principles that have been around for decades and are well established and accepted, uh, the actual impl implications and implementation can, can vary quite dramatically. Next slide, please. And I'm not expecting to read the details on this, this slide particularly, but what I hope to demonstrate here is that translating those principles into practice leads to huge amounts of variation. And this is uh, a, a snapshot of what uh, newborn screening programs are, are doing in Canada. So you'll see that not only do the number of conditions included in the screening panels differ between the provinces, but there's quite a range of uh, conditions that are varied between the different programs. Some, some are consistent across all programs, some only appear in a couple of programs. So there's clearly a step between those principles, the evidence that should seemingly, one would think, be available to all these programs, and then the, ultimately the decisions that are being taken about what conditions should be included in the programs. Um, and so our, our work was really to sort of delve into that, that piece there. So how do we get to these decisions that are being made? How are those decisions, you know, what goes into that decision-making process and who are involved in that decision-making process? And from the outset, we identified at least four, four different groups, some of which may be more obvious than others. So we, in, we identified that there will be healthcare professionals involved in the delivery of the care, uh, you know, the delivery of the program, laboratory tech, et cetera. There would be parents whose children would be screened positive and therefore would be at risk of these conditions. But there would also be uh, families who would go through the program and have no further follow-up. They would screen negative. And then finally, there's the, the broader public where in any uh, healthcare system with a finite set of resources, there are opportunity costs uh, of choosing to do one thing or another. And so that, that was another group we identified as having a, a, an interest potentially in these decisions because uh, investing in newborn screening means that that funding cannot be invested somewhere else. So again, we, we looked at it through this lens to really sort of try and delve into that decision-making process. Next slide, please. So we did two, uh, a two-stage project. The first was a documentary analysis where we, we looked at the websites, government reports, et cetera, for the different programs to try and explore this, this process and see whether information was available about how decisions were made to add or remove conditions. Uh, and then we did follow-up interviews where we reached out to the different programs to try and get insights into how the uh, decision-making process works. And we spoke to eight individuals from five of the different programs across the country. And this table just gives a snapshot of uh, the types of groups that are involved, but also that inclusiveness uh, and deliberative quality. And this was taken from the framework that runs throughout the book. Um, and what you'll see is, there is very little information actually about the programs themselves in terms of how they make decisions, uh, in terms of what conditions should be added. There's a lot of information about how the programs run, how tests happen, et cetera, et cetera, but very little information about that process of decision-making within the program. Uh, one of the exceptions here is uh, Ontario, which actually has on its website a description of the nomination process that the public can actually as along with healthcare professionals and others, nominate conditions for consideration, and they actually include their um, decision-making sort of schematic, which includes uh, a line about evidence around stakeholder interests, as they say. So, but in the majority of cases, very little information publicly. Similarly, very little information in terms of how those decisions are made, who's involved, and so forth. There are some examples of post hoc feedback after the implementation of a program, like how it's working, but that really is not uh, involved in the decision making process. So this sort of really just highlights to us that there's very little information out there um, for the public anyway. Next slide, please. Um, and so we applied the REACT framework, which again was used as a, a framework across many of the case studies in the book. Uh, and having spoken to these individuals and, and through our documentary analysis, we, we really sort of came to the conclusion that there are very few regulatory interventions that affect the decision-making process in newborn screening. Ultimately, decision is taken at the government level. So but there's very little information about how that process interacts with what was the majority of cases, a sort of advisory role. So 
in most programs, there's an advisory committee that's struck and they, they assess the evidence uh, and come up with a, a recommendation that goes forward to government. Um, very few uh, sort of technological interventions. So technology might have been the instigator for the process of reviewing conditions. You know, there might be technology that allows the expansion, but wasn't really the driver or involved in the decision-making process itself. And as I've already alluded to, very little community intervention. But the other main driver really appeared to be economic intervention. So really making decisions about what was the funding envelope? What was the cost of the screening? And could that be accommodated? So those economic and advisory interventions really seem to be the main way that decision making happened. But there was very little information, even after the interviews, about the weight that different components had in terms of uh, ultimate decisions. So I'll, I'll wrap up there. and. Um, Happy to discuss further any of this in uh, the Q&A. Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Stuart. And, and I can recall, you know, learning about uh, your case over the process of the at-risk project and just being struck at, at how limited the level of public participation appears to be for, you know, for, frankly, for a screening uh, procedure that, that arguably affects all Canadians. Um, so really fascinating and, and very much looking forward to uh, delving into it with you in a little bit more detail as we get to the Q&A portion of the session. Uh, so for now, Michelle, we will turn to you. You had two chapters uh, in the book. You were very busy contributing with multiple co-authors. So really looking forward to uh, hearing your uh, presentation today. Thank you, Monica. And um, as I wait for my slides to come up, I just want to acknowledge that uh, I'm at the University of Manitoba. And so I want to just acknowledge that the lands on which I live, work and play uh, are located on Treaty 1 territory in the homeland of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the OJ Cree, the Dakota and the Dene peoples. The Inuit from the north who reside but use services on these territories and the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. And the drinking water that I will use over the course of the our time together comes from Treaty 5, so it comes from uh, Northern Ontario, and so it's just to kind of help highlight and underscore some of the challenges that we face um, as, as a colonial country and many of the harms uh, that have occurred on these lands. So what I'm going to talk about today um, is going to kind of be uh, building off what Stuart has just outlined, and thank you so much for that, Stuart, around some population-based screening programs, looking at mammography and PSA testing, but then also looking at a different um, aspect uh, that we explored within this work around uh, priority group setting for COVID-19 vaccines. And so I'm, I want to acknowledge my co-authors on this work and uh, some of the funding support that we received to help uh, support part of this, but it also was part of a much larger group than that. Next slide, please. So generally speaking, when we're talking about screening programs, population-based screening programs, this is where um, citizens who meet certain age uh, or, uh, or uh, gender characteristics are invited, otherwise healthy people are invited in to come see if there is potentially disease. And it's done at a time that is ultimately designed to try to help prevent cancer deaths and identify that early detection in a way where the balance of harms and benefits, um, the benefits outweigh the potential harms, and that it is done in a way that is fiscally responsible in terms of how we manage and use public resources. And one of the um, efforts around making decisions and informing provinces and territories and how these kinds of guidelines and programs will be rolled out within their different jurisdictions, there's a great deal of reliance on some of the work that is done by the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care, where effectively they do a lot of evidence reviews to assess what those guidelines ought to be. Um, and what I have here, and I know on the graphic, you can't see everything, but just on the left or at least on my left side, uh, the, the circles that we see um, in the middle uh, where that um, arrow is kind of pointing to is to just kind of showcase what each of those circles are so that you can you can see them. But there are these different levels of engagement with different kinds of uh, constituencies. So expert uh, who experts who conduct peer review of the guidelines, but there's also some citizen and some clinician engagement around these guidelines and the tool developments. 
There's broader partnerships that exist in terms of collaborations uh, with national health organizations to provide input into this and then some outreach uh, from a media level. Next slide, please. But one of the challenges in terms of the management of PSA testing for men and mammography uh, is that there's there is no actual organized screening program for PSA testing. The level of evidence around the benefit of PSA testing as a screening tool has never been demonstrated. And so what we see happen in many jurisdictions is what's seen as opportunistic testing. So where because of those discussions that uh, a, a male may have with their provider, they might be sent for PSA tests to monitor what might be taking place. But effectively, the guideline hasn't changed too much since an assessment in 1994 and even reaff re reaffirmed again in 2014 that the evidence still wasn't very strong to support the use of PSA as an effective strategy for identifying in a population of otherwise healthy men uh, if there was potential for prostate cancer. Mammography screening, by contrast, there are organized screening programs, but most, and because of the way the guidelines are structured and have been over time, it's women over the age, you know, 50 uh, to 69 who are invited in for um, population-based screening. And where the guideline has been more in a situation of uh, shifting has been in the area for women of 40 to 49, where in 1994, the assessment had been there was no evidence to demonstrate that it was worthwhile bringing women into this pot that from that age group for organized screening. In 2001, the evidence kind of was the interpretation was, well, it's kind of unsure. But then in 2011, it was a reaffirmation of what happened in 94, that the evidence really wasn't strong the harms that were associated with the uh, testing women in that age group of 40 to 49 was really provide providing more harms than benefit. And so in 2011 and again in 2018, when it was reaffirmed again, that that age range should not be incorporated into these organized screening programs, those broad invitations that are purely when you have otherwise healthy people. This is in contrast to a situation when somebody might be, whether they are a man or a woman, presenting to their provider with symptoms which might require investigation. We're not talking about those kinds of scenarios. Next slide, please. But unfortunately, the, uh, the task force isn't the only game in town. And when we start thinking about what happens at this micro level, particularly when uh, patients go and they see their providers and Either they're, you know, they're interested in maybe exploring various uh, options that could be available to them. Those conversations are informed by things that they've read in the media. It might be things that are coming from different associations, um, as well as advocacy groups that, and particularly in the cancer context, there's often this notion of early detection is your best protection. And if my doctor doesn't know about it, then they can't help me. So there's those kinds of competing pressures that take place in this micro environment in that uh, clinical encounter, which then might contribute to additional kinds of testing that might take place, but those still function outside of that organized screening program. Next slide, please. And some of the challenges that we face in this is, you know, we have our guidelines, but then we have our reality. So as I said, with PSA testing, there is no organized screening program, but there is a lot of, uh, there are high rates of this unorganized and opportunistic use of the PSA as a test that is used as an informal screening mechanism. Um, and then also for mammography, uh, you know, all of the provinces and territories that have an organized screening program start at age 50, but some jurisdictions do allow for women in the 40 to 49 age group to self-refer or participate um, in this uh, with a referral from a primary care provider. Next slide, please. And one of the things we did kind of outside of the scope of what was described in the chapter, but was related to some of this work was in some additional work we had, we had focus groups with men and women um, around PSA testing and mammography screening. And what was interesting in our focus group discussions with women in two different cities, um, 
we wanted to see how women responded to the what the guidelines were and particularly whether women in that 45 to 49 age group might think about and talk about risk or perceive their risks associated depending on which group they were um, sitting with. So in our, we had some groups that were women 35 to 49. Um, and then in our, we had other groups that were for women of 45 to 69. So we wanted to oversample in that 45 to 49 age uh, grouping just to see if the dynamic of the broader group in which they were based, if that shifted how they viewed their risk. And we use these um, graphics at the time to document, you know, the evidence uh, back in 2011 when we were doing when we were doing these focus groups. That was the latest evidence that we were relying on. The evidence was to provide to prevent one cancer death for women in 40 to 49. They would need to screen 2,108 women, and there were 690 that would have to go for additional testing. Um, and 75 of them would have unnecessary biopsies. So some of the harms associated with this for the number of women that needed to be screened was part of the, the rationale for why screening should be focused on women 50 to 69. And what was really interesting to us in that work that we conducted is that the women under the age of 50 were quite comfortable with the evidence and the rationale for why they weren't included as part of this broader population-based screening, knowing that if they had symptoms or if they identified um, you know, a lump or something that needed further investigation, that could still occur. But it was the women in the 50 to 69 group that kept looking at this of, well, you know, we should be comfortable with facing all of those potential additional harms if it's to save that one mother. And so it was just interesting in this group that the women who were now already of the age range to be in invited into this population-based screening were still feeling that it needed to be extended and started at an earlier age. Next slide, please. So and now I just want to kind of bring a different element around some of the tensions that we uh, look at when we're, we're dealing with public engagement and, and, and get into the issue associated around COVID-19 vaccine prioritization. Um, and a lot of that was informed and knowing that there would be, as we were rolling out vaccines, insufficient vaccine supply for everybody. So there would need to be some kind of rationalization for how uh, groups might be prioritized. Next slide, please. So just in terms of understanding within um, the vaccine context and the different actors that are involved in helping to inform and provide guidance, I mean, it's Health Canada from a regulatory perspective who is responsible for making decisions about which drugs, vaccines, um, therapeutics, uh, technology or uh, health technologies that will be used uh, and approved. So they have that regulatory authority. Um, but after the severe acute uh, respiratory syndrome of uh, SARS of 2003, one of the responses into how Canada could do a better job in managing um, uh, public health uh, infectious outbreaks was to create the Public Health Agency of Canada. So the Public Health Agency of Canada contributes very much in terms of our national surveillance of infectious disease outbreaks. They have reporting requirements that are uh, necessary within the World Health Organization. And then when it comes to uh, providing additional guidance around um, vaccine recommendations for different population groups after Health Canada has made its regulatory decision, it delegates some of that responsibility to the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations. And NACI functions very much as an expert group of looking at evidence once vaccines are rolled out at a population level to continue to monitor the evidence and incorporate any of that uh, epidemiological knowledge in some of the recommendations that they make. So in anticipation of some of these, uh, when vaccines would become available for COVID-19, one of the efforts within NACI was to create an ethics, equity, feasibility, and accessibility framework, which was uh, a, a series of efforts um, designed to try to come up with strategies and, and mechanisms for making some of these decisions or making some of these recommendations that then jurisdictions would uh, ultimately work into their plans. 
And it involved um, expert and stakeholder engagement, as well as surveys with the public uh, as they developed this framework. And ultimately, from this, some of the framework principles that came out of it for how they would prioritize for COVID-19 vaccines was to protect those who might be most vulnerable to severe illness and death, protect healthcare capacity, minimize transmission of COVID-19, and protect critical infrastructure. And as they were engaging in different waves of these surveys with Canadians, you know, initially there was a lot of support uh, for those with underlying medical conditions, the elderly healthcare workers, and so forth. But by wave seven, this emphasis started to shift uh, around wanting to have greater prioritization for healthcare workers, followed by people with health, uh, health conditions, frontline workers, and then those living in long-term care facilities. So there was just a, a shift over time in terms of those public preferences, but at least there was a mechanism by which to try to make those assessments. Next slide, please. Um, one of the recommendations that had been uh, incorporated as part of these prioritization was that Indigenous um, communities, uh, people of First Nations, Inuit and Métis ancestry, should be prioritized to receive early access to vaccine once it was going to be rolled out within the jurisdictions based on however those provinces and territories would choose to incorporate that into their decision making. Because ultimately these are recommendations that then it's up to uh, the appropriate health jurisdictions to make the policy level choices as to what will actually be rolled out. All of the jurisdictions, the provinces and territories accepted this recommendation of Indigenous prioritization of First Nations, Inuit and Métis for COVID-19, except for Manitoba, which was really quite ironic because only during pandemic H1N1 had Manitoba been the province that actually prioritized people of Indigenous ancestry, of being First Nations, Inuit and Métis for early access to vaccine. So there was a period of about four months when other jurisdictions were rolling out these vaccines uh, and prioritizing Indigenous Canadians that in Manitoba they were only prioritizing First Nations and then that got modified to incorporate Inuit and, and Métis in May of uh, 2000 and, or 2021. The pandemic has taken a life and sometimes I start to lose track of exactly what year we were talking about. Uh, next slide please. And we had this opportunity in some of our research, we had focus groups that were taking place in three different cities with uh, Canadians in December. So just as vaccines were first being um, authorized by Health Canada for COVID-19, and we presented to focus group participants, you know, a series of, of potential groups for priority options. And so there were opportunities to rank these. And so these were the options that had been uh, presented to focus group participants and the list kept getting changed so that there would be, a, um, it wouldn't be a response bias based on what's at the top. And um, next slide. But what we found in our research is that public, our, our public focus group uh, efforts in December of 2020 had some of the common preferences for that prioritization, being healthcare professionals, people with underlying health conditions, but almost tied with essential workers. And members of our focus groups were wanting to prioritize those individuals who had you know, effectively facing jobs, uh, you know, very poor job security in public facing roles. So grocery workers, people who had to still work during the pandemic, when we were in various uh, uh, states of lockdown, knowing that if they missed going into work because they got sick, then they wouldn't have any kind of those benefits to help support them. But also because they were so public facing, if they didn't have early protection, they could be infecting other members of the public being allowed to go in and shop for groceries and that kind of thing. So they were prioritizing that group a little differently than others. And then looking at those in long-term care facilities, one of the challenges in all of this is that when you don't actually try to do engagement around equity seeking and equity deserving groups, sometimes they can be lost in the mass. So that's one of the, the advantages of the efforts that was conducted by NASI and really thinking about from an equity perspective, 
Um, indigenous peoples uh, weren't quite top of mind within some of our focus group participants, even though we still had a diverse group of Canadians uh, participating. And then there ended up being a bit of a disconnect or a cognitive dissonance in, in some people's minds around, you know, they wanted to prioritize others to be first in line. And some of them confessing that their own concerns about a willingness to accept a novel vaccine was, well, let's first see what happens with those who are prioritized. And so even within some of the focus group discussions, it became, uh, you know, it's like really important that we protect our frontline health workers because they're the ones looking after us if we show up with disease in hospital and need care. But, you know, let's also test the vaccines on them to make sure it's safe. And if, you know, if they're still around, well, then at least it should be OK for us. So it became kind of a, a, a an interesting logic in their in their processing. Uh, next slide. So as we kind of grapple with these issues of the importance of, you know, as Stuart identified, we're dealing with a lot of normative values when we're making decisions about things like vaccine prioritization, when we're making decisions around population-based screening programs, who values, who's to wait, how are we going to manage all these things? And we need to do that when we're dealing with public resources, public funded um, health systems. But now how do we try to incorporate that engagement in a way where it's not just, you know, pulling in the opposite directions of one group want one thing and another group wants something else, but finding legitimate and uh, not legit, find, finding meaningful opportunities to incorporate this as an additional important piece in how those decisions get made. And I'll just stop there so we can open up to discussion. One wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. And and just maybe a, a special word of thanks, Michelle, to to you and collaborators. Um, we uh, you know when we began the at risk project, it was prior to the pandemic, and then of course when we moved into publication of the book, um, there was an opportunity to include a section around COVID nineteen. And uh, very grateful to yourself and to a number of other uh, research collaborators who stepped up to. Uh, uh, to that challenge. So I see uh, we've already got uh, folks beginning to weigh in uh, with questions, which is great. I have a, a whole slew of questions, but if I will not pose them if we've got questions coming in in the Q&A. We've got a terrific uh, group of people in the audience. So please, uh, you know, please do uh, please do use that Q&A box and um, share your questions with us. Donna Long de De, de votre choix. So the, the first question um, that we have, uh, Michelle, looks like it's for you, or at least, yeah, it looks like it's for you. I didn't understand the basis for the irony in Manitoba. The questioner says, I understood that Manitoba was the only province to refuse to prioritize vaccinating Indigenous people, but the only province to actually do it in practice. Have I got that right? If so, the end result might be explained by political muscle. 18% of Manitobans are Indigenous compared to 5% on average across Canada, and then there's a, a, a link pr provided. So did you want to um, respond to that, Michelle? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I just realized yeah. I had muted myself. Um, yeah, it was one of those interesting tensions because the other jurisdictions, I mean, there were a number of challenges from a practice perspective in how uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis were um, prioritized for vaccine and had access to those vaccines in other jurisdictions. And I know that there were a number of challenges, but in Manitoba, initially, it was only going to be First Nations. So only First Nations were the, they were the only Indigenous community or Indigenous nation to be incorporated as part of prioritization. And there were no plans. Man Inuit and Métis had to access vaccines in the same way as any other Manitoban did, based on age um, categorization, if they didn't fall into one of the other um, uh, categories that were eligible for prioritization. And the other thing is that in Manitoba, when they were prioritizing First Nations, they were doing it at a 20 year age, younger age than whatever was being done for general population. So if they were prioritizing Manitobans who were between, you know, 90 and up, then they were prioritizing First Nations who were 70 and up. So they had that, they always worked in at a 20 year age uh, younger, but only for First Nations until May 2nd, when the province announced that they would now do this for all Indigenous in the province of Manitoba. Uh, 
I don't know if that answers your question. Thanks, Michelle. I'm wondering, did you want to add something as well? You know, it goes beyond the work that you shared in the book, but uh, the work that you did previously on prioritization of, of Indigenous uh, peoples in Manitoba for the H1N1 uh, vaccine. If I can uh, ask you to go back into your memory banks for uh, some of the findings of that work, which I thought were extremely fascinating from a public trust in, in health decision making uh, perspective. Well, it was one of those inter uh, interesting differences in terms of how Manitoba responded to the H1N1 pandemic. They had different tables that were trying to look at the evidence and making recommendations. There was an equity table specifically. Um, and it was from that engagement with First Nations uh, uh, and like so federally with First Nations and Inuit Health Branch, but they also brought in the Manitoba Métis Federation, working with local or uh, provincial uh, First Nations groups specifically in the province. They expanded it to include Métis. Uh, and so they, right from the, the get-go, they prioritized people on the basis of Indigenous ancestry. Federally, the recommendation was around those who were living in um, northern or more remote communities, which when you look at our Canadian context also typically will capture an Indigenous population. So using a basis of geography for that prioritization as opposed to using um, indigeneity. And initially with H1N1, some of the reaction from urban Indigenous or from uh, Métis specifically was a bit of a distrust of, is this vaccine being tested on us to make sure it's safe before they give it out to the white guys? Because again, there was that conspiracy um, tension and element within it. And here was an opportunity where Manitoba, having done that during H1N1, could have capitalized on having that, you know, it, with COVID continuing in that same vein, given that that's how it was being recommended for other jurisdictions and other jurisdictions were ostensibly following that. And now it was a reverse situation where Métis citizens were like, well, so what, we're, we don't count as Indigenous now? We're Indigenous in some ways, but we're not Indigenous in others. And it's always that feeling of we're always kind of left out. So it's, it's, it was a, an interesting tension. Mm -hmm. No, and I think it, it raises um, um, the whole topic, or at least from my perspective, uh, anyways, of, of trust and, and trust in, in health decision making. And I'd, I'd like maybe just to kind of open it up to, to both of you uh, to reflect on what, you know, what some of the research that you did uh, for this uh, book, uh, you know, kind of what does that shed light on for us in terms of, of trust and, and trust of, uh, of people in, in public health uh, decision-making. Stuart, maybe I'll go to you since you haven't had a, an opportunity to weigh in yet. Yeah, I mean, we didn't sort of look at public perception of trust in, in the programs. Uh, what I can say is that from the interviews we did, um, the advisory bodies that worked, you know, usually came up with a recommendation for the newborn screening families. It seemed to be that there was a, a high degree of trust in that recommendation from the government. So it, the, the discussions we had was very rarely, if ever, would those recommendations not be taken forward. There was a great deal of trust placed in, in those. Usually, if it wasn't taken forward immediately, it was usually because of one of those economic uh, drivers that I mentioned. So maybe there was not budget at that moment or, or something like that. And we heard sort of that even the advisory panels were sort of aware of these budget limitations, they may not put forward a condition for expansion, knowing there might be budget issues. So they would wait until a new fiscal year or something like that and sort of do that. Um, I mean, in terms of the uptake and things like that from other work, you know, there does seem to be, newborn screening is a sort of perhaps less, seem to be as less controversial than some of the other screening programs. Um, I don't know whether, that's because it's on, on newborns and, and, you know, it's minimally invasive, short term, you know, it's a one one off kind of program and there's not sort of repeat mammography, repeat testing, etc. Uh, and it does, you know, most of the conditions, if not all of them, traditionally anyway, have been sort of highly treatable in terms of, mm -hmm. if not, not curative, but actually treating the, the symptoms of the problem. So there does, you know, there's a big impact there. Um, so I I do think that sort of you know, 
you know, it's not maybe very well known in the public consciousness, but among those in the community, I think it does have a great deal of trust. And I think it's it's interesting that it's within the commu newborn screening community, there's a great deal of trust and interaction between the provinces, not necessarily on a formal level. As I say, there's no federal oversight, there's no sort of structure there, but actually working together to solve problems, to discuss issues, there's a it does seem to be a really sort of tight community that trusts one another. So I don't, again, maybe not the sort of same issues of trust that in the examples Michelle gave, but uh, certainly trust does come into it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Michelle, what, so any reflections from your side on either or both of your chapters? Well, I mean, I think it, what, what Stuart has identified is some of the shifts in the comfort level and the kind of the willingness the public has in place around trust and confidence in the kinds of decisions that get made, at least within the health domain. You know, it, it has these grades and it has these these levels where depending on how the issue itself is being perceived there is that willingness to accept and defer of, you know, okay, if those are the recommendations, I have confidence that those decisions have been made in, you know, the best interest of everyone. And yet by the same token with other things, it, that, that same extension will not be applied. We see this within the cases of um, vaccines tends to be one of those areas which really generates different levels of um, concerns uh, for people and where that level of trust will, will vary quite uh, substantially, um, where even there is a greater trust in, okay, I'm willing to take a drug therapy that a provider is recommending for whatever condition I might be having, even though you know, it might be facing various kinds of side effects and 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 other potential more serious downstream effects, but not willing to accept those same recommendations from a provider if they're talking to them within the context of accepting a vaccine, either for themselves or for their children, where now all of the sudden the the motivations of that provider is now being called into question in a belief that, oh, well, you're just being told to push this on me because the government tells you so, or pharmaceutical companies are, you know, encouraging you, you make money on giving me these vaccines. Like all of a the sudden there is a very different kind of brush uh, and distrust around even accepting recommendations from a provider or accepting recommendations from a health body that they would otherwise accept in different contexts. Yeah, no, I think I think that's really interesting, Michelle, and certainly something that came through in the research for this book across, frankly, across all of the different topic areas, whether, you know, genomics, public health or or energy that that, you know, so many of the issues around risk perception, around levels of trust that are very context uh, dependent and on the case of vaccines in, in particular, as you know, but I'll just share this for, for those who are watching. Um, there's just an excellent chapter um, by Kieran uh, O'Doherty uh, around uh, vaccination of, of children and a, a, just a very fascinating um, exercise that uh, he and collaborators uh, ran around uh, public deliberation process for, uh, you know, for issues in that area that really revealed, as you're pointing to, Michelle, sort of a, the, 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 the wide diversity of issues that, that people bring uh, you know, to their concerns over over vaccines. Um, I see that we've got a, a question here that's come uh, from actually one of our practitioner members on the at risk uh, project, Bob Walker. Uh, thank you, uh, Bob, for for chiming in. Um, so his uh, comment here, a question is where communities are identified to be invited to be screened. Uh, and he, you know, exam for example, with the case of mammography, do we have data and resulting insights regarding who agrees to participate and in particular where one chooses not to, why not? Yeah, I mean, within that there are there's data that is collected on the part of the screening programs that are managing that and knowing who's coming in. There are efforts to try to remind uh, those who have been invited to come participate. And there are many different reasons for, for why somebody might not choose to participate. 
But there's also particular barriers that some might face. So if we look at, you know, our uh, Canadian uh, context, we have a number of people that access to where those screens are, you know, those screening opportunities are provided. Um, it then, it, it makes it difficult for them to participate. So there have been efforts to have mobile clinics and uh, at least in the case of mammography, having uh uh, those that that equipment kind of in a mobile unit, then going around to visit to help to reduce some of those barriers. Stuart, anything you'd like to add to that question? Um, I mean, I think again, I was going to make the same comment. You know, in terms of the sort of choice versus systemic or you know infrastructure barriers, I think a lot certainly within newborn screening, there are it's you know it's a very small proportion who actually actively choose not to to undergo screening actually when when people don't have a, a screen uh, it's often more of a, a failure of the system uh mm. they were missed or, or something like that um and but i i do know you know there are colleagues here who are doing implementation science behavioral economics and looking at finding ways around those infrastructure or systemic barriers to to look at ways we can implement these programs to provide access where that's that's the major failure. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things, just to, Michelle, if I could come back to you, one of the things that I found so fascinating about um, your chapter, particularly on the, on the mammography case, the, the concept of shared decision making, um, you know, between physician, primary care provider and, and patient uh, in instances, you know, sort of the flip side of, of the question that was posed where, where, um, you know, the, the, uh, screening is not uh, recommended, but that, you know, somebody in the sort of 40 to 49 age category, for example, but that uh, is requested. So really the other side of the coin. Um, I, I wonder if you wanted to speak to that a little bit, because I, I found that quite fascinating in terms of, you know, the, the, the flexibility or the discretion for physicians to recommend, even though, you know, sort of population health data might not support a screening, uh, but that it potentially leads to greater trust uh, in physicians in the public in the healthcare system uh, writ large. So really be interested to hear a little bit more from you on that topic, Michelle, if you could. Yeah. And I mean, we've, we've done some more recent work around PSA testing, even in Manitoba around um, primary care providers who are deemed high orderers. So they have a, they, they tend to order a fair amount of PSA testing within their practice group compared to those who might be median orders. And we actually saw some differences in terms of gender and age, even around some of that. But a lot of it really kind of comes down to what are the opportunities for those discussions? So typically these occur within um, well uh, visits, right? So our physicals that we might have annually, those are typically 20, 30 minute appointments. There's a lot of things that need to be managed and a provider is having to balance in that, having time for those discussions around some of these tests, in addition to monitoring a whole series of other things. And so different clinicians have had different strategies in trying to manage those conversations. And where for some of them, it's been, you know, it's important to have that discussion with the patient. And if the patient is still interested in the test, then, you know, they help to facilitate that because it's also part of that. They're not trying to be a gatekeeper to the system. Mm -hmm. um, but having that time for that conversation isn't always consistent. And some have used some really interesting strategies to navigate that while still trying to foster that trust in the clinical relationship by, you know, having the, making the time or saying, okay, well, you know, I'll order the test for you if that's what you want. Let me explain to you what we know within the, the current guidelines. Um, and sometimes after that discussion, a patient will say, oh, thanks, I didn't know all those things and I'm willing to wait. But knowing like even as a strategy right up front, I will order it for you if you still want. That's how some have, have managed it. Others have done things particularly because they've come into practice groups that they've inherited. So it's they're in, uh, a newer um, clinician within that, that group is to while not trying to um, affect the trusting relationship the patient had with the previous provider, but saying, you know, there's new evidence that have, you know, or the new evidence that is out now or the evidence that we know now recommends not doing this. And again, we'll go back to that 
um, if the patient still wants it, often that it becomes that judgment call. Not that those providers are just blindly doing it, but you know, it does come into play. But it is challenging to have the time to actually have the conversation. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle, for for that. Maybe um, just before we we sign off, maybe 30 seconds, if I could, from each of you, and I know that's tough, but where do you see public participation and public involvement uh, in your respective areas of, uh, uh, of research going in the future? Are you optimistic, pessimistic? What, what do you see on the road ahead? Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Stuart, and then uh, conclude with Michelle. Yeah, so uh, definitely, I think it's a, an area of expansion the strategy for patient-oriented research, which is the program of the main medical research fund of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, is undergoing a refresh at the minute. They're de developing their priorities. And I think it's definitely going to be a key pillar going forward. Uh, I think the main challenge is to sort of balance that authentic engagement with a recognition that this is something we should be doing and becomes tokenistic. And we have to sort of find that balance that we, we do it in a, in a good way. Great, thank you. Uh, Michelle, last word to you. Sorry, I had a hard time with the unmute. Um, I, I agree with Stuart. I mean, these are things that we do have to, to balance and how we do. And I think it's an important part of how we make, uh, at least at a policy regulatory decision, because these are value laden choices, having input into that meaningful input that's not tokenistic, but finding strategies on how can we do that effectively, which is how, you know, some of the research uh, efforts around implementation, but also around engagement and, you know, what are some of the best strategies or best practices in doing it so that there are supports in place for it to occur and inform that debate. Wonderful, wonderful. This has just been a tremendous uh, discussion. We've covered an awful lot in a very short period of time. So I uh, wanted to thank both of you very much for your participation. And, and of course, thank our attendees as well. Uh, our final word today goes to Yasmina El-Harim. Uh, she's going to offer some concluding remarks uh, on behalf of the Institute. Thank you so much, Monica. So I would like to also start by thanking our panelists today, uh, Dr. Michelle Driedger and Dr. Stuart Nichols, and our panelists in ISSP on our moderator and SSP director, Dr. Monica, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today for this great discussion. I would also like to thank our audience. Uh, thank you for your engagement and thank you for your support to the ISSP. Um, I shared some links in the chat just to stay connected with the ISSP and most of mostly uh, stay tuned. Uh, we have another um, Food for Thought coming up in February, which is going to be hybrid and it's going to be presented by the ISSP's 2024 Fulbright uh, Canada Research Chair in Science Society, Dr. Alita Quinn. Uh, so please make sure uh, to stay connected with us and to join us next month. Um, thank you so much once again for joining us and wishing you a great afternoon. Thank you.